guys, it is time to check our work from yesterday. Um, so that's probably where we're going to start today. Um, we want to keep in mind what our end in mind is for this week. And it is identify the causes and effects, excuse me, get this in my pocket, of the main character's actions and thoughts based on the setting, situation, and his character traits. So we're thinking about cause and effect relationships. So we know that um, at least one of our questions dealt with that cause and effect, and, and we'll get to that one in just a moment. Our vocabulary for the week, and as we are reading, we normally would have, um, you would have tagged your vocabulary words or you would have shown them to me so that we could um, get blocks for those. But at this point, as I'm reading or as you're reading, I want you to keep in mind um, what the words are and what their meanings are. Unduly is excessively, and we had that word in our reading yesterday. Intact means it is whole. Incessant is constant. That was also in our reading yesterday um, about the mosquitoes. We talked about the mosquitoes and how there was that incessant buzzing and whining. Refine is to improve. Um, he had to refine his shelter in last week's reading um, to improve it after the skunk got in and got the eggs. So now that the shelter has once again been destroyed, it's going to give him a, a, a yet again another opportunity to refine slash and or improve. Murky is cloudy. Frenzied is that excited um, kind of thing. And I talked about piranhas yesterday. Instinctive is spontaneous and unthinking. It's where you do something before you think. Sometimes um, people that have ADHD or attention deficit um, hyperactivity disorder, they will do things before they stop and think. That is part of their syndrome and is part of what makes them uniquely them. However, it sometimes can get that person into a little bit of trouble. That instinctive or spontaneous kind of action is not always a positive thing. Rummaging is where you're searching for something and you're just kind of like digging through, trying to find it, um, and just that looking, looking, looking. So let's take a look at our questions here. And I'm sorry I'm kind of fumbling today. I've got some um, extension cords going on. This feed takes a lot of battery life, so bear with me. Um, question number one says, how does Brian feel about the pilot? And what does Brian do? Well, we know Brian, once he, the plane is sticking up out of the water, he kind of goes, oh, the pilot. Maybe not in those words, but he's, he starts thinking about the pilot. And we know that he feels bad about the pilot. And, and we know that because on page 149, at the bottom, um, it says, he thought of the pilot still in the plane and that brought a shiver and massive sadness that seemed to settle on him like a weight. And he thought that he should say or do something for the pilot, some words, but he didn't know any of the right words, the religious words. So we know that he feels bad about the pilot being dead and the actual textual evidence that they give us or the adjective they give us is that he feels sad about the death or about the loss of this particular person. Let's look at number two. It says, compare serious injury to the death for someone alone in the wilderness. And I will tell you that year after year after year, I have students who just cannot get this question on their own. So if you'll go to page 151, giving you a minute. That one, two, third paragraph, middle of the way, it says, Brian felt lucky once more that he had not been killed or more seriously injured, which would have been the same, he thought. If he couldn't hunt, he would die. 
If he were injured badly, he would not be able to hunt. So a serious injury um, would be the same because with death, let's say that it says compare serious injury to death for someone alone in the wilderness. If you break a leg um, and you break an arm, you have an ATV accident or you have a car accident, your parents will go to the hospital with you, though you'll get bandaged up, you come home, and you don't have to worry about food and shelter and someone taking care of you. If you are like Brian, out in this wilderness all alone, and you break an arm and a leg, and you are not able to go out and hunt or to keep your firewood going, you will die because you cannot take care of yourself. So a serious injury equals death to someone that is alone in the wilderness. It's the same thing. So he's talking about how lucky that he was, that Brian felt lucky once more that he had not been killed or more seriously injured. And our textual evidence goes on to talk about those how those are equal things in that particular paragraph. Let's look at um, number three. What is the best definition for the word sanity? And I think it's on page 102. Um, sanity, the best definition there would be reasonableness. And when we think about, um, the, the author says that Brian will find food and refine the camp. So what they mean about that is that things will become more normal. So sanity in this instant and reasonableness kind of match because he's wanting things to kind of go back to the way that they were before. Um, it's, it's a word that is similar to normal, I guess, is where that's going. So they really wanted you to use some text clues um, to kind of figure that out. Last but not least, how does a tornado affect Brian in a positive way? That is our drawing conclusions, quite our cause and effect um, end in mind here. The cause is there was a tornado. And we talked about all kinds of negative effects yesterday. The negative effect was um, his shelter was destroyed, his fish pond was destroyed, um, that um, his food storage area was destroyed, was destroyed. All of those are negatives. So what is the one positive effect that happened? Yes. That positive is that now part of that plane is sticking up out of the water and he's starting to think about that survival pack, you know, and where it was located in the plane and would it not be damaged and could he use it? And those are things that he hadn't really thought about before because it was submerged. How was he going to get to it? But now he's thinking, hmm, maybe. And that's where we stopped yesterday with those particular questions. Now, I would like us, let me turn to day two here, to go to page 153. So if you all can do that for me. One fifty-three. We set that over there. And we're gonna have a seat, if y'all don't mind. I'm gonna have a seat, even if you do mind, but let me kind of find myself a spot here. All right, so here we go. One fifty-three. Well, yes, one fifty-three. I made myself a note here where to stop. Just like in class, guys, I still gotta find me a place to put my sticky note. So bear with me. There we go. 
You may not have sticky notes, but I have sticky notes. Got them all over this house. All right, 153. <clears throat> In the morning, he rolled out before true light. In the gray dawn, he built up the fire and found more wood for the day. Feeling almost chipper <clears throat> because his ribs were much better now. With camp ready for the day, he looked to the lake. Part of him half expected the plane tail to be gone, sunk back into the depths. But he saw that it was still there. Didn't seem to have moved at all. But he looked down at his feet and saw that there were small fish in his fish pen looking for the tiny bits of bait still left from behind the wind came, left from before the wind came. He fought in patience to get on the plane project and remembered since, remembered what he had learned. First food, because food made strength. First food, then thought, then action. There were fish at hand here, and he might not be able to get anything from the plane. That was all a dream. The fish were real in his stomach, even his new shrunken stomach, was sending signals that it was savagely empty. So he made a fish spear with two points, not peeling the bark all the way back, but just working on the pointed end. It took him an hour or so, and all the time he worked, he sat looking at the tail of the plane, sticking up in the air, his hands working on the spear, his mind working on the problem of the plane. When the spear was done, although still crude, he jammed a wedge between the points to spread them apart and went to the fish pond. There were not clouds of fish, but at least 10. And he picked one of the larger ones, a round fish, almost six inches long, and put the spear point in the water, held it, then thrust with a flicking motion of his wrist when the fish was just above the point. Well, the fish was pinned neatly and he took two more with the same ease, then carried all three back up to the fire. He had a fish board now, a piece of wood he had flattened with his hatchet that leaned up by the fire for cooking fish so he didn't have to hold the stick all the time. He put the three fish on the board, pushed sharpened pegs through their tails and took cracks on the cooking board and propped it next to the reddest part of the coals. In moments, the fish were hissing and cooking with the heat. And as soon as they were done, or what he could stand, when he could stand the smell no longer, he picked the steaming meat from under the loosened skin and ate it. The fish did not feel him, did not even come close. Fish meat was too light for that. But they gave him strength, and he could feel it moving into his arms and legs, and he began to work on the plane project. While making the spear, he had decided that what he would have to do was make a raft and push paddle the raft to the plane and tie it there for a working base. Somehow he would have to get into the tail inside the plane, rip or cut his way in, and however he did it, he would need an operating base of some kind, a raft, which he found ruefully was much easier said than done. But there were plenty of logs around. <clears throat> the shore was littered with driftwood, new and old, tossed up and scattered by the tornado. And it was a simple matter to find four of them about the same length and pull them together. Keeping them together was the problem. Without rope or cross pieces and nails, the logs just rolled and separated. He tried wedging them together, crossing them over each other. Nothing seemed to work and he needed a stable platform to get the job done. It was becoming frustrating, and he had a momentary loss of temper, as he would have done in the past when he was the other person. At that point, he sat back on the beach and studied the problem again. Since he had to use his sense, that's all it took to solve problems, just sense, it came then. The logs he had selected were smooth and round and had no limbs. What he needed were logs with limbs sticking out. Then he could cross the limbs of one log over the limb of another and weave them together as he had done his wall, the food shelf cover, and the fish gate. He scanned the area above the beach and found four dry treetops that had been broken off by the storm. They had limbs 
and he dragged them down to his work area at the water's edge and fitted them together. It took most of the day. The limbs were cluttered and stuck any which way and he would have to cut one to make another fit, then cut one from another log to come back to the first one, then still another from a third log would have to be pulled in. But at last, in the late afternoon, he was done and the raft, which he called brush pile, one for its looks, hung together even as he pulled it into the water off the beach. It floated well, it flowed in the water, and in the excitement, he had started for the plane. He could not stand on it, but would have to swim along it. So, one of the things that if we are thinking about cause and effect, is that while Brian is making his fish spears, it's giving him the opportunity to think about that plane. And... So the effect is that it takes, that it gives him time to think about how to get out to it. You know, he's thinking about how I'm going to get there. And, and it dawns on him that he needs a raft. So that's the very beginning of it. Now, Let's think about when he realizes that the logs that he has gotten, the first set of logs, aren't going to work. He becomes frustrated. You know, he's like, what the heck? Then the effect of being frustrated is he takes a deep breath and he's like, that's not going to do any good. Let's just rethink about the problem. And so, you know, he rethinks about the problem and he realizes, hey, I've done this before. I need these limbs or these trees that have um, branches. And I almost think about it as plaiting hair. You know, one goes on top of the other and, and you're, so you're kind of crisscrossing it to kind of make it tightly together. So he's weaving those limbs together. So when I think about the second raft that he's trying to construct before he even does it. The cause is he has learned to harness his frustration from being there so many days. The effect of that is, you know, he's allowing himself more time to think rationally. So it's like, don't be mad, don't get upset. What am I going to do now? What else can I have? What else do I do? So when I think about cause and effect relationships, you know, he's thinking about the setting that he's in. And that goes right back to our end in mind over here. Cause and effect in the setting. He has to use what he has on hand. And what he has on hand is trees. And so he's going from there. Before I read another word, though, I'm going to give you a minute to break down your questions. So if you'll do that, they're very short. So do that real quick. All right, so we know we've got number one that says, how does Brian feel about his surroundings? And that one says right beside it, but we're going to write all four. We need to keep that in mind. Number two, what motivates Brian to continue trying to enter the plane when the thought of the pilot inside is upsetting to him? So when it says what motivates Brian, it's like what pushes him to continue to try to get in. You know, we all have things that motivate us, whether it's get all A's and I'll give you money for your for all the A's on your report card. Or, um, you know, if you can hit a home run at the game, then I'm going to we'll do this. So everybody has things that motivate them. So what motivates Brian to continue trying to get into that plane 
even after the thoughts of the pilot inside is kind of upsetting to him. Three, how does Brian get into the plane? That's a right there kind of answer. And number four, how does dropping the hatchet affect Brian? We know to go ahead and circle number four because that is an end in mind question. It's the wanting to know how did it affect him. So the cause is he dropped the hatchet. The effect then would be what? How does, how does Brian react or what happens with Brian? That's what we're listening for. All right, we are on, it looks like 156. Let's start at the second paragraph at the top. And I think I just read it, but I kind of want to make sure. But at last, in the late afternoon, he was done. And the wrath, which he called brush pile, one for its looks, hung together even as he pulled it into the water off the beach. It floated well, if low in the water. And in the excitement, he started for the plane. He could not stand on it, but would have to swim alongside he was out to chest depth when he realized he had no way to keep the raft at the plane. He needed some way to tie it in place so he could work from it. And for a moment, he was stymied. He had no rope, only the bowstring, and the other cut shoestring in his tennis shoes, which were by now looking close to dead, his toes showing at the tops. Then he remembered his windbreaker, and he found the tattered part he used for an arrow pouch. He tore it into narrow strips and tied them together to make a rope or tie down about four feet long. It wasn't strong. He couldn't use it to pull a Tarzan and swing from a tree, but it should hold the raft to the plane. Once more, he slid the raft off the beach and out into the water until he was chest deep. He had left his tennis shoes in the shelter, and when he felt the sand turn to mud between his toes, he kicked off the bottom and began to swim. Well, pushing the raft, he figured, was about like trying to push an aircraft carrier. All the branches that st stuck down into the water dragged and pulled, and the logs themselves fought any forward motion. And he hadn't gone 20 feet when he realized that it was going to be much harder than he thought to get the raft to the plane. It barely moved, and he kept going this way. He would just about reach the plane at dark and he decided to turn back again, spend the night, and start early in the morning. And he pulled the raft once more into the sand and whop, scraped it dry with his hand. Patience. He was better now, but impatience still grounded him a bit, so he sat at the edge of the fish pond with the new spear and took three more fish, cooked them up and ate them, which helped to pass the time until dark. He also dragged in more wood, endless wood, and then relaxed and watched the sun set over the trees and back of the ridge. West, he thought. I'm watching the sun set in the west, but that way was north, where his father was, and that way east, and that way south. And somewhere to the south and east, his mother would be. The news would be on the television. He could visualize more easily his mother doing things than his father because he had never been to where his father lived. He knew everything about how his mom lived. She would have the small television on the kitchen counter on and be watching the news and talking about how awful it was in South Africa or how cute the baby in the commercial looked, talking and making sounds, cooking sounds. He jerked his mind back to the lake. There was great beauty here, almost unbelievable beauty. The sun exploded the sky, just blew it up with the setting color. And that color came down into the water of the lake. It lit the trees. Amazing beauty and he wished he could share it with somebody and say, look there and over there and see that. But even alone, it was beautiful and he fed the fire to cut the night chill. There it is again, he thought, that late summer chill to the air, 
the smell of fall. He went to sleep thinking a kind of reverse question. He did not know if he would ever get out of this. Could not see how it might be. But if he did somehow get home and go back to living the way he had lived, would it be just the opposite? Would he be sitting watching television and suddenly think about the sunset up in back of the ridge and wonder how the color looked in the flake? Sleep. I want to stop right here a moment and allow you just a, a minute or two to look at your questions and in lieu of sticky noting, we're gonna make some notes in our team talk. Page numbers, paragraphs, those types of things um, before we move on to the next, finish our reading. All right, 158. We're almost done, guys. In the morning, the chill was more pronounced, and he could see tiny wisps of vapor from his breath. He threw wood on the fire and blew until it flamed, then banked the flames to last and went down to the lake. Perhaps because the air was so cool, the water felt warm as he waded in. He made sure the hatchet was still at his belt and the raft still held together. Ben set out pushing the raft and kick swimming toward the tail of the plane. As before, it was hard going. Once an eddy of breeze came up against him and he seemed to be standing still. And by the time he was close enough to the tail to see the rivets and the aluminum, he had pushed and kicked for almost two hours, was nearly exhausted and wished he had taken some time to get a fish or two and had breakfast. He was also wrinkled as a prune and ready for a break. Well, the tail looked much larger when he got next to it, with the major part of the vertical stabilizer showing and perhaps half of the elevators. Only a short piece of the top of the fuselage, the plane's body toward the tail, was out of the water, just a curve of aluminum. And at first, he could see no place to tie the raft but he pulled himself along the elevator to the end, and there he found a gap that went in up by the hinges where he could feed his rope through. With the raft secure, he climbed on top of it and lay on his back for 15 minutes, resting and letting the sun warm him. The job, he thought, looked impossible. To have any chance of success, he would have to be strong when he started. Somehow, he had to get inside the plane. All openings, even the small rear cargo hatch, were underwater, so he couldn't get at them without diving and coming up inside the plane where he would be trapped. He shuddered at that thought and then remembered what was in front of the plane. Down in the bottom of the lake, still strapped in the seat, the body of the pilot. Sitting there in the water, Brian could see him, the big man with his hair waving up in the current, his eyes open. Stop, he thought. Stop now. Stop that thinking. He was nearly at the point of swimming back to shore and forgetting the whole thing. But the image of the survival pack kept him. If he could get it out of the plane or if he could get just get into it and pull something out, a candy bar, even that, just a candy bar, it would be worth it but how to get at the inside of the plane. Well, he rolled off the raft and pulled himself around the plane, no openings. Three times he put his face in the water and opened his eyes and looked down. The water was murky, but he could see perhaps six feet and there was no obvious way to get into the plane. He was blocked. <clears throat> so we're gonna stop right there for the moment. 
I'd like you to make notes about evidence and before um, we continue with what we're doing. All right, guys, that finishes our lesson for today. So when we come back to our next video, we'll finish our reading and then we'll talk about the questions that we're going to answer um, that come from our team talk. So see you in a minute.